Good morning. Many thanks for taking the time off to attend this lunch, which I see as a gathering of friends and colleagues after 30 years of the pandemic. Lest I am reduced to a woman babbling incoherently, please allow me to be forthright in response to the unbelievable display of such warmth and generosity in the speaker's wholesome place for what I have done for years as a teacher and a critic. Many thanks to Patricia Kwanan, Marie Vilches, Marjorie Velasco, Brother Bernie Oka, and of course, my favorite, he could have been my son, <laughs> if I could. Maraming salamat sa inyong kapahalaga sa aking magsisikap na iangat ang antas ng panunguling mapanitikan, lalong-lalo na sa mga akta ng mga kabuluhan sa karibawang Pilipino sa loob ng mahabang panahon. <clears throat> Before I begin the mandatory acknowledgments, let me answer the question, why do I write? And why do I write what I write? That was the original topic for a lecture I was supposed to give. Complicit without being aware of it in my own miseducation in the 1950s and 1960s, I was forcibly thrown into an arena of youth's ideological struggle in the late 1960s and early 1970s, when as a woman in my early 20s and as a graduate student at the Ateneo, I was sucked into a vortex of violence as the country spiraled out of control. Put simplistically, the struggle was between the foreign and the native, Western hegemony and suppression of the indigenous literary studies. It was a battle between <clears throat> the dominance of English literature, Western and written by Filipinos, and the consequent marginalization of vernacular texts. Suppressed and rendered mute and powerless, the ordinary Filipino nonetheless managed to engage with countless poems, plays, novels, short stories that resonated with them. <clears throat> to understand these texts is to catch a glimpse of the psyche, the people's dreams, aspirations, visions of what should be in the face of such devastating exploitation and victimization. The question that faced me in 1970 was, for whom are you writing? The answer was simple. I chose to write for the people by retrieving buried texts and forgotten writers. And there were thousands of them that spoke to and reflected the people's varied experiences as colonials. As importantly, I sought to, as other critics tried to do, valorize those texts that for so long had been denigrated and vanished into the periphery as improper objects of academic study. These texts were permitted entry into the hallowed halls of elite universities shaped by Eurocentrism. In other words, I wanted the literature of the marginalized and the outsider put on center stage. Thus, I chose certain areas where I could make some contribution in the process joined a handful of like-minded scholars such as E.R. Semi Manuel, Damiana Eugenio, and Leonardo Lumbera, to name a few. The first area was literary history. I was shocked by the absence of compilation of primary texts in the appalling dearth of secondary materials. I had to start from scratch, first do archival research, dirty my hands, hop from one library to another, looking for materials, even scraps of paper. We helped me first of all create a narrative of the life and career of Macario Pineda, the subject of my MA thesis. Without any help from technology, I proceeded to look for and read 300 Tagalog novels for my dissertation, contextualizing the novels against history and society. Second day, I wanted to find out how the critics arrived at their judgment and why this poem was mediocre and that poem superior. I sought to explain the roots of the theories by, chaining, by tracing their influence to Western critics from Plato and Aristotle to Korean Brooks and P.S. Elliot and to Mao Che Tung. Third, I thought the role of history was underemphasized. No text, no author, no reader exists in a vacuum. Each component is shaped by history 
culture, and ideology. History is not merely describing the time and the view. History is at the center of any narrative. Rizal's novels influence generations of writers who view historical events as integral elements of their narrative. The story of the hero comes back from abroad and works to change the community. As we repeated in countless stories and films, Volume to mind the reformist Ibala and in Anar Anarchist Simon. Joseph Estrada and Fernando Po Jr. parlayed their immense power as actors in politics and sought to merge fantasy and history. They were saviors that the miserable poor needed. Both attempts eventually failed. Fourth, there was an elephant in the room of ubiquitous comics, which initially they attracted the attention of millions, but had been despised by the educated class. I grew up reading The Adventures of Ken Coy, Calabong and Rosho, Tarna, Palos, and Indio, but I did not realize how potent these characters were and how much they shaped the people's perception of reality. For example, because the government and its agencies have repeatedly failed to come to the aid of beleaguered Filipinos, the comics world teemed with poor but kind heroes and heroines given strange mysterious powers to help the victims of natural disasters and of evil men. Yet, the comics has been unjustly labeled as Bakia and Padui, pandering to the worst taste for sex and violence. But studies of the comics have revealed how the writers created foils to the real world, to the make-believe world where a lot of things are possible. The stuff of much of popular culture, written in English, even the valorized writing of C.S. Lewis in J.R. Tolkien, in Hollywood films and television series. Fifth, I saw another marginalized sector in the hundreds of female writers using Tagalog in writing for you by wife. Their stories attack as whiny, sentimental, weak, not logical, didactic, lacking the sinewy strength of male writing. My books, Olina Flor and Fred Wismaninga, suggest a contrary view, that of courageous and hardy cultural workers whose range was overwhelming as in Olina Flor and whose incisive forays into areas explored by very few writers, men and women. Contemporary science, the religious cult led by false prophets, the greed and opportunism behind popular movements, the dysfunctional family life, and the systematic oppression of women in a phallocentric society demonstrated women's courage to go beyond surface reality. Finally, in the autumn of my life, when the passion had been partly satiated, my age of the dominance of all the powerful paradigms had diminished, the fire in my belly reduced to a flicker, I yearned for quiet tea. I translated on novels because I wanted to showcase this treasure trove, a remarkable by of those works. I wanted to prove that the country was more than its white beaches in Boracay and Eurasian-looking women competing for international beauty titles on the one hand. Or the killing fields for government-sanctioned murders its abject poverty, its women and children trafficked, and murderous regimes on the other hand. I wrote because, quote, at my back, I always hear time swinging carry of carry you live. And yonder, all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Unquote. I wrote because when I studied the old text, I come across various interpretations of complex feminine reality written without the benefits of creative writing workshops that the desire of being accepted abroad. My writing then becomes an interpretation of thousands of interpretations earlier produced. But in the end, I end up discovering those parts of myself that have remained hidden. As somebody said, I'm quite private, although I'm really not on the outside an act of a painful self-discovery and sometimes of liberation. An obsession, Karina asked in the review, is it an obsession, a compulsion? It is an obsession, a compulsion, perhaps. There is no closure, that is all I know. Only a journey that will never end, but slower paced. 
As the Bible says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let me now thank the following. This is the more enjoyable part. <laughs> the Della Sal University and its president, Brother Bernie Oka, Brother ex Department of Literature, the Benvenido of Santos Created Writing Center in Montbon, the publishing house headed by David Lyot, whose prodigious mind and stimulating spirit of inquiry enabled me to undertake various book projects. The national artist Ben Cobb and artist columnist Alfredo Roses for giving us permission to use their artwork, thus enhancing the thematic and aesthetic value of the books being launched. The presence of some Jesuit priests, fathers, yeah, Lilia Dean, Debrez, Samson, and Mother Mario Francisco. And the administrators of the Ateneo, it's a stark reminder that the, that the Ateneo Tenenel University first welcomed me when I was a graduate student, nurtured and supported me through many decades, helped me weather some deadly storms in my career, and always inculcated the lesson from Father Arupe that indeed we are men and women for others. I owe the university my profound gratitude and deep respect. My mentors, especially the Pedro Lumbera and Rolando Guino, and colleagues not only from the Ateneo, from various universities with whom I work to further the cause of cultural studies in the country. All the writers and their writing that I analyzed and whose insights taught me a lot about being a Filipino, taking up a cause greater than the individual's interest. My former students who are now professionals giving their all to serve the country. My former classmates in grade school, were there, and high school for over 50 years, they remained my friends. My family, the world is stayed in the background, but just love and concern for me especially. <clears throat> when the world is too much with me, remain firm and unconditional. Special thanks to my siblings, my Kuya, Alice Gina, Connie Dick, Eric and his wife, Marinette, for always being there, especially during my sickness. To my nieces and nephews who have turned out to be responsible adults, their children are a source of joy and delight to me. Kiara, the youngest, where are you, Kiara? Has taught me how to look at the world in the eyes of a child. Kiara, can you stand up and say hi? Kiara, where are you? Hello? Hello? <laughs> 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 My very special thanks <clears throat> to my guests of honor, doctors from the U.S. Hospital, who have accompanied me on a difficult journey towards healing. Doctor, doctor, doctor Graciela Gonzaga is barely five feet tall, but to her, but to her countless patients, she casts a giant shadow. She overflows with love and compassion for those men and women who come to her for help. She calmed me down with her kindness and no-nonsense explanation in the initial stages of the treatment. I remember spending some time talking about our childhood growing up in small towns, our struggles as we ventured forth in life, and what our careers have taught us. She is a woman of science, but more importantly, a woman of deep faith. The second doctor is, um, has a previous engagement, so he's not here. If Dr. Gonzaga was the carrot, Dr. Takila de los Agnes was the stick. He was a stern looking man and extremely disciplined. My illness was a strange terrain over which I had lost control. With great efficiency to control in the first two months. But he was kind and generous with his time. He patiently answered my questions about the illness and kept quiet when no answers were forthcoming. Once after I had exhausted myself, venting my frustration, at my inability to understand anything, he gently said, Abang buhay, may pag -asa. By the way, the Rotak of the Los Angeles is a relative of the great nationalist, Servando de Los Angeles, 
a pulsating journalist, poetic sarsuela writer, and the author of Huling Limawa, a classic novel that offers a penetrating analysis of the roots of the Petan Rebellion in Luzon. His descendants must be truly proud of him. Dr. Regala, are you here? Dr. Regala. Dr. Regala. It's a true blue academia. Having spent his grade school and high school at the Ateneo, he exuded confidence and was always reminding me that I would get well and that the treatment was nearing its end. I imagine myself looking at the sky and seeing nothing but dark, fierce, and threatening clouds. You know, they're pessimistic. Dr. Regalo, on the other hand, would gaze at the sky, nod his head, and mutter to himself, it's a starry, starry night. <laughs> With apologies to Vincent Van Gogh and Don Joaquin. Until now, he talks fondly of his Jesuit mentors. Thank you very much. <laughs> Final words. Alam natin na ang lahat ay napaparam, naglalako, nawawala, at madalibin sa limon. Katinyagan, kayamanan, kapangyarihan, maging ang kaligayahan, at iba't ibang uri ng pag-ibig. Puspos ng kaligayahan ang aking puso sa mga sandali nito. Pinamalas ninyo ang iba pamalasakit at ang mga sakit na hindi umingin ang katumbas. <clears throat> Timiti ako sa inyo na ngunit muli kong babalikan ang mga sandali nito, emotions recollected in tranquility, sabi nga ni Wordsworth, sa aking pagpahak sa <clears throat> malalagi pang panahon na aking buhay, sa randa sa mga bato, madawag, matinig at pagiging. Ganyan niyo ako sa loob ng ilang sandali, ng lakas ng loob, ng mga pagpalang biyaya, at sabit sa lahat, ng liwala, na siya kung magiging tanglaw sa kanila ng buhay. Muli, matawas na pas, salamat sa inyong lahat, at magandang mga.